Good evening, everyone. I am, my name is Carly Boalo, and I am the gallery assistant for Cambridge Art Galleries. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to tonight's artist talk with Chloe Lum and Yannick Derenlo. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which Cambridge Art Galleries is situated is the traditional uh, land of Indigenous peoples going back countless generations. It is part of the Haldeman Track, which is the traditional land of Six Nations of the Grand River and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations. I'd also like to take this moment that as we gather virtually, we are gathered um, around different lands tonight and many places which belong to First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. Um, we recognize that many of these places um, in which we gather are their home and it is important to acknowledge this as it is a part and a big step in towards reconciliation. I'd also like to take this time to remind you that even though this is a virtual event, Cambridge Art Galleries and Idea Exchange is committed to inclusion and equity and inclusion, and that the code of conduct does still apply. Um, so if anyone is in violation of this code, then they will be removed from the event. Um, I'd also like, like to let you know that this event is being recorded. Um, so that it can be accessed later by yourself and those who cannot attend. But don't worry, we can't see you. So only the panelists and myself are being recorded tonight. Um, so it is my very much um, great pleasure to introduce Chloe and Yannick. They are multidisciplinary Montreal-based artists um, whose exhibition, Is It the Sun or the Asphalt, All I See is Bright, Bright Black, is now on view at the Queen Square Gallery. Chloe and Yannick's artistic practice focus on theatricality and the choreographic in both their performance work, but also in their interest in staging tableaus and working with ephemeral materials that can be said to perform through redeployment and decay. Their most recent works investigate the agency of objects, the material condition of the body, and the transformation, uh, transformative potential that bodies and objects exert upon each other. These interests are informed by Chloe's experience with chronic illness and its effects on their collaboration, as well as their exploration of narrative tropes from literature, theater, and television. Um, thank you, Chloe and Yannick, for joining us tonight. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of their presentation. If you uh, navigate to the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button on your Zoom screen. That is where you can click in and ask your questions for them. So without further ado, I'm going to send it over to Yannick and Chloe. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Carly. Uh, we're really glad and happy to uh, be part of this presentation. And uh, we're talking to you live from Montreal. And um, yeah, so I guess we'll start right away. I'll do a little screen share. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. We're, we're basically in this talk going to kind of do a real deep dive on the, the video work that we're the installation video installation that we're showing at Cambridge Gallery. If you haven't seen it yet, um, that's fine because we're going to be showing a lot of short excerpts and just kind of talking about our kind of ideas behind this work and how they kind of uh, snake around in, in our other, uh, in the rest of our practice. Yeah, so um, is it the sun or the asphalt? All I see is bright black is a video installation and a sculptural installation. There's, uh, the video is uh, divided in 10 sketches, although they're seamlessly woven together uh, in the installation. And what we want to do uh, like Chloe said, like is really kind of explore those main themes, like talk about the main themes that we explored through this work. And um, the first kind of idea uh, that we touched on in this work is this thing called thing theory. We'll play this uh, the little uh, excerpt from the first sketch, uh, which is titled It. And it's about a minute long. It has a special value to me, one that goes beyond anything you would offer for it.
They say, well, if it is so special, you need to be much more careful with it. doesn't need preciousness. I understand it because I became physical with it. I know it because I messed with it. So as Yannick was saying, um, in this work and in, in our body of work, we're really interested in the idea of thing theory, which is a, a philosophical framework um, that, that's been posited by Bill Brown, who's a literary theorist. And it really has to basically, it's as simple as this like deep investigation into the kind of affective relationships that we as human beings have with the inanimate objects in our lives um, as, as vi both people who are visual artists, but also who are collectors of all kinds of ephemera, um, this, I, this, this investigation of these kind of relationships is super interesting to us. And in this work in particular, we really kind of wanted to explore that by having these different type of abstract objects that the performers would work with, where the objects would really seek to influence the way that they would be performed. So objects would have different types of textures, of weights, of um, kind of movement through different types of material. And th through this, kind of, um, I guess, fluidity, we're positioning the objects as collaborators with the performers themselves. Um, and again, like this really comes uh, both in obsession that we have with the maid and how the maid ends up being this constant uh, augmentation of the body. So like everything from like, clothing to the chairs we're sitting in to um, cars to ever all of the things that we use that all end up in being attached or in encasing our bodies and also the idea of collecting and we really in this piece um, the the performers are all directed in a in a kind of loose way where they often are able to choose the prop that they use and the props were really meant to be arranged in a kind of collection. So um, I, I'm gonna read a, a really short passage from Clarice Lispector's uh, novel, The Passion According to G.H. Um, and in this book, the, the main protagonist, well, the only protagonist, she's a sculptor and you, you have her talking about her relationship with things. So, I always liked to arrange things. I guess it's my only real vocation. By putting things in order, I create and understand at the same time. But since I, gradually, through reasonably good investments, I became fairly well off, this hampered me in my ability to use this vocation of mine. If money and education hadn't put me in the class I belong to, I would normally have worked as the maid who arranges things in a very large home of rich people where there is much to arrange. Arranging is finding the best form. If I had been a maid arranger, I wouldn't have needed the amateurism of sculpture. If with my hands, I'd been able to arrange things for hours on end. So inspired by uh, this writing, we uh, did a second sketch, which is uh, title gather is the ninth sketch in the uh, order that they're presented on screen. And this is uh, Lady Davis, uh, the performer who's performing it.
teacups and saucers. something so satisfying, so right about taking things and presenting them into groups. This is why I do what I do. Fancy things found in thrift shops, dusty things found in basements. growing in the soil. So, um, so yeah, so pushing on this idea uh, and exploring this, this notion from Bill Brown of Think Theory, uh, it brought us to kind of like want to kind of explore further, you know, uh, not just like the um, effective relationships between the beings or us and objects and the objects that surround us, but also perhaps like the kind of greater environment that we live in. Uh, because Bill Brown talks about this thing, you know, think theory in this kind of um, in, 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 in the comprehension of the kind of ethical contracts that we have with things uh, and leading us to do, you know, kind of different actions with them because, you know, we develop those uh, effective relationships. But uh, to us, like, it, it, we were kind of asking ourselves, well, what about this applies to the greater environment we live in? And uh, what if this question, these questions are the kind of behavior we have with our environment could be put into questions or into this kind of same kind of questions that uh, Bill Brown puts forward in his writing on thing theory. So uh, those next clips, those next sketches are about that, are kind of those ideas kind of push further. The first one is uh, titled Territory and uh, this is Winnie O who performs it. And it is kind of questioning about our the legacy that we're leaving, you know, in terms of our built environment and the impact that we have on the places we live, and this kind of like kind of greater ethical comprehension of like uh, <clears throat> human interactions with nature, but also at a perhaps like a even greater scope like colonialism, etc. So let's play it. When I walk around or do errands, I often try to picture my surroundings, how they could have looked before human intervention. And I mean intervention at the scale of hydraulic shovels and steamrollers. hill over there is it natural <laughs> just dirt heaps dug up from somewhere else then dumped there so um taking this kind of idea perhaps a bit more like in a literary uh literally like we uh also decided that in the production of the video was this kind of idea of the environment around us or, you know, the, the environment of our production studio would be kind of included uh, in the making of uh, the video pieces. And, but also, you know, like in kind of like what 
justified our ideas for choosing uh, to hang the installation the way we did at Shatter. Um, so yes, for the soundtrack, for instance, uh, we worked with composer Julie Matson, who's a Montreal, well now, what was at the time in Montreal, but now a Vancouver electroacoustic musician. And uh, I, you see here a, uh, a still shot, a production shot from uh, like one of the shooting days. And we see Winnie like with microphones in front of her uh, on the ground, picking up the ambient sound, which uh, was the, the recording of this ambient sound was then sent to uh, Julie, who used the sound, those sounds and stretched them out and kind of enhanced the harmonics to create the soundtrack that you hear that backs up the voiceover uh, on the videos. So th the soundtrack is really built from um, recording and playing with all the kind of incidental noises of the performers moving in the space with the objects. Still on the same subject matter, but perhaps in a much darker note, this idea of the place of uh, humans in nature and the legacy they leave uh, is also explored in uh, Sketch 7, Redden and Cena. At the same time, more playful, but kind of darker way, because like we kind of basically ask like, you know, we, we basically kind of question our, our, our user, <laughs> like basically we kind of like say that like humans perhaps are a bit futile and maybe will disappear someday. It's, it's, it's quite dark, but um, talking also about the soundtrack, this is the only clip that is uh, you have live sound and uh, non slow motion action. And at the same time, it's a testament of the set we were working in, working with, but also a, uh, a recall of the origin of the piece, which uh, like the whole installation, the whole video piece started as a live performance piece. And we thought it was uh, interesting to have that like somehow like revealed in the, in the video work. Also because the script being so simple on this one, on this sketch, it, it made no sense to do it in slow motion. And Lily being such a, uh, Lily Davis, performer being such a good theater person, <laughs> interpreter, performer, we were like uh, really glad to have her uh, have the chance to do it, do this sketch live. So we'll play a short clip of it. Filling time and filling space. Filling time. Filling space, that is why we are here. Filling time. Okay, so well, again, I'm not used to this. Okay, so um, so yeah, and uh, we had a Claire Suspector quote here. Yeah, so <clears throat> basically, we're getting into this idea where, you know, if 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 things are things, and our relationship with them is a thing and the environment we live in is a thing and we are things as humans maybe our you know our position is uh not uh the top of the hierarchy that um sometimes culture would mm -hmm. assume it to be uh and i think like with us it, it, we're really you know try again in a lot of our work we're really navigating this ambivalence of being artists who have a very material practice who make stuff who are also really aware of the contradiction of making stuff in an ecological crisis and what kind of ethical gray area that puts the artist 
you know us in and it it's uh you know something that just kind of ends up leaving leading to a lot of reuse and kind of creative remaking but also to a lot of ambivalence um i'm gonna read another short passage from the passion according to gh uh reading these passages just to kind of show exactly where what we're talking about when we're talking about the literary and storytelling really influencing our work. So the world reclaimed its own reality. And after a catastrophe, my civilization had ended. I was nothing more than a historical fact. Everything in me had been reclaimed by the beginning of time and by my own beginning. I had moved on to the force foreground. I was in the silence of the winds and in the age of tin and copper, the first age of life. So yeah, and uh, like Clarice Spector is one of the authors, like Bill Brown, like one of the authors that we were reading at the time that we wrote, is it the sun or the asphalt or I see is bright black? And, uh, and yeah, and like, you know, this, those influences really kind of transpired through the sketches and, you know, like really, really what were those ideas are all starting points that then like became new works after this one. Uh, Cause we really see this, this one like video and installation is kind of like a kind of turning point in our uh, art making. Uh, Speaking of um, new uh, subject matter, like number three, uh, sick and crypt theory, which is like a, the third subject that we're touching in on uh, in this work. Yeah, I think this piece was the first work of ours where we started um, dealing autobiographically with the fact that I was dealing with the chronic illness, uh, neurological condition that was really uh, drastically changing my ability to make work or to even be a person in the world um, because it was having such intense symptoms of pain, fatigue, and uh, vertigo. Um, and, you know, it was... It, it was like an uphill battle to get a diagnosis. And I think when we started working on this piece, I, I had had a diagnosis and a, and a very patchwork treatment plan for maybe about nine or 10 months at this time. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, it, you know, realizing that, oh, no, I'm not just burnt out or something. I actually have a, a chronic illness that is probably going to be uh, there for the rest of my life and I'm not going to really be able to get out of this with yoga and herbal teas, which was super maddening and upsetting and but also I think kind of laid the groundwork to really talking about, you know, these kind of things autobiographically. I, I mean, in a kind of uh, dark irony, it was really becoming super ill that really kind of pushed this kind of thinking that we had towards uh, working um, choreographically and with installation um, that was really like engaging in the haptic. The, these kind of things really came forth with me thinking about illness and how my body no longer working the way I had understood it for the first like 37 years of my life on um, how this rupture was really <clears throat> seeing the bot the human body as a thing mm -hmm. and as a thing that could function or not function but that it could also function in different types of ways that could you know be left to discover um I was really reading a lot of disability theory and it's kind of spin off sick theory, uh, which is like really more specific to chronic illness and invisible disabilities. Um, and this kind of strange navigation of 
you know, often passing as a, as a healthy person while being anything but. And one, one of the thing, one of the things that really kind of, I guess, uh, more kind of seminal texts in, in this area was uh, Elaine Scarry's the, the Body in Pain. And I'm going to read a very short little passage and then we'll look uh, what's the next clip? Uh, it's Euler number six is the and, first, the first one. The and then one. we'll look at a, 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 another excerpt performed by Deborah Dunn, mm -hmm. who is a dancer choreographer who we work with a whole lot, who had actually talked to me a lot about um, some health challenges she had gone through recently and uh, which is one of the really um, kind of generative aspects of talking more autobiographically because then you work with all these people who are like, oh, me too. Um, so uh, th this um, idea it was something that was all, I was already thinking about uh, kind of sideways before I read this book. And then when I read it, I was like, oh yes, this is actually a thing. The presence of the body in the realm of artifice has as its counterpart the presence of artifice in the body. The recognition that in making the world, man remakes himself. So this, this kind of idea of making ourselves through the built, through the made, um, is, I wouldn't say liberating because I'm a, not a very optimistic person, but it's interesting. <laughs> we'll play the short clip from the six. When I first became ill, I wished to erase my body entirely, to become a floating thing. I think otherwise. I cannot give up on being solid. I cannot stop wanting to affect space. Referring also to uh, in the installation itself and the choice of props, we uh, chose to make references to the medical and these kind of ideas of like around the body or like the body in some kind of medical situation. For instance, the use of chrome steel all over um, over the installation, like into the screen structures or and uh, the table legs, for instance, or the little kind of sculptural props on the ground over and over, uh, because those are the kind of materials and colors we see like in the accessories and medical equipment and so on, or brush steel, for instance. It's just this kind of shiny receptive quality of it. But also uh, next one is like the, in the choice of colors, uh, think of the different kind of flashes evoked by like the kind of gamut from pink to brown uh, or like Pepto pink, <laughs> which they, the fluorescent pinks are very kind of vivid pinks that kind of like remind of this kind of medication or yeah. Well, and every kind of like mm -hmm. bandage is always this like weird, gross, mm -hmm. Barbie peach color that mm -hmm. no one in reality is ever. And it's all, I mean, to me, that color is kind of the, like, really the look of being in the hospital. <laughs> and also the, the, the choice of colors, especially for the screen in the installation that you'll see on your right, um, and that you see here in the background, like those kind of institutional colors, those kind of pastels or, you know, like not too like armful colors if you mean that you also often see in hospitals those kind of like mid greens and 
beiges and grays and so on. <clears throat> and then we have the, the black rubber, which is just utilitarian. It's a device and it can't be any fun and it can't be aesthetic. It's just, you know, the color is not thought about. Um, a, uh, another subject around like another kind of like sub subject, like a, in the kind of old sick theory uh, theme was uh, this idea of in, invisible illness. And this is like uh, the case of a lot of people who are chronically ill is like um, this kind of like how you appear in public and, you know, like how you enjoy your life and this kind of like idea of exposing or not uh your illness <clears throat> to people that you meet outside your home and uh this is something we explore like through the thematic of the mask and this kind of like you know hiding oneself like through material or through you know a condition if you decide to kind of like show it or not and how like this kind of like results in some kind of like kind of personal performance in a way that you know as some kind of like impact on interpersonal relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And again, you know, this is like kind of pulling on auto autobiographical uh, notes from to his experience. Yeah, but I mean, it's also something that a lot of uh, people who write about chronic illness mm -hmm. write. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose everything <laughs> so here's a uh, short excerpt from mask perhaps it's the pretense of not being oneself when masked that allows me to act like myself under their cover perhaps it's the pretense of not being oneself when masked that allows me to act like myself gone to take all masks off. It's a spell by concealment. Putting the mask on to take all masks off. It's a spell by concealment. Looking around you can't see a thing and that's soothing. This type of mental displacement that ordinary nakedness would not allow. And this was Anouk Teguiou, who performed in Masked. And the mask, uh, there, there's actually more than one. There's, I think, three or four in the entire installation. And what's interesting is those came about, actually, those came out of, like, just studio material sculptural exploration that we started before we even uh, wrote uh, the sketches for this piece and it just kind of all kind of coalesced together as kind of a way to kind of like vary our approach with uh, this one subject matter uh, so yeah you see an example of two of them as you uh, that are part of the installation and the props that were used by the dancers or performers. Uh, another uh, sketch uh, titled Embarrassment kind of explores another facet of the same idea of uh, how to deal with this kind of like exposure of oneself and this kind of idea of like performing health or performing sickness. And uh, also, the, you know, kind of questioning if this can be a way to empower oneself or not. So uh, here we have uh, Deborah Dunn again. This is, this is why the communion I have with my feelings comes ahead of any of their possible translations by the outside world.
circumstance is the distinguishing feature of my individuality. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this idea of uh, alterity, you know, the kind of the different facets of the body, but also like this idea of, uh, of uh, normalcy, you know, that we kind of try to debunk with this kind of like uh, evocation of, you know, the different states that the body can be in or like this idea of performing normalcy. Uh, now, uh, or like basically meaning that alterity would be the default mode of the body. Uh, is then further furthered on with this fourth subject matter, uh, the cyborg. Yeah, um, I mean, we're we're really interested in um, Haraway's uh, Donna Haraway, Do Donna Haraway um, theory of the cyborg, and this idea that all bodies are um, altered in in some way or another mm. uh, through different types of technology, through um, medical interventions and devices. And that through time, these alterations are in flux and can accumulate. And also the kind of corollary idea to that, that, that bodies are inherently contingent and constantly changing. Um, this uh, makes their position as a thing uh, super interesting because it can always inhabit space differently. And uh, its tasks or uh, dance um, differently. Uh, just a, a really short passage from Haraway, where I, I think she she gives the 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 kind of um, succinct definition of how her how her idea what her idea of the cyborg is that really made us relate to it. Um, she writes the cyborg is resolutely resolutely committed to partiality, irony, intimacy, and perversity. It is oppositional, utopian, and completely without innocence. No longer structured by the polarity of public and private, the cyborg defines a technological polis based partly on the revolution of social relations. So yeah, and uh, the interesting thing about uh, cyborg manifesto, cyborg theory, and these ideas coming from Arroy is uh, those are kind of the events that are happening in the performances we're doing with the with our uh, collaborators uh, as they take those objects, they kind of prolong their own limbs and kind of create or enhance their bodies and in weird and unexpected ways and that's kind of like the both the challenging thing and the really exciting thing about uh creating in this matter and kind of uh, uh making a movement and and uh, provoking new relationships or unexpected relationships and movements between bodies and objects yeah like our interest in working mm -hmm. with these kind of props that we make and having them performed is that the the props can influence the the movements that the interpreters that we work with will do and that in some ways they can like you know make them be able to reach out into space more but in other ways it can hamper the movements by being awkward by being heavy by being unwieldy mm -hmm. and in that hampering of movements then there has to be a new type of way to move um and yeah, we're, we're interested in, in, in finding what, what those new kind of ways of being are when the, the most obvious way of being becomes difficult. So we'll play a short clip of uh, the last sketch parts. I figure, I figure I'd, replace I'd replace the parts, the parts that were problems, the ones that, the ones that caused pain. pain. Not just not remove, just remove and, leave and leave a void, but become, but become partially, partially artificial. Then 
then I realized, better than, better than replacing creaky, creaky joints, joints, why not just, why not add, just parts add parts on? on? Go, go beyond, beyond adornment and add, and add an, an exoskeleton, exoskeleton of absurdity. Of absurdity. To create, to create and punctuate, and punctuate new, possible new possible movements while constraining others. And uh, what we want to bring on now is perhaps a uh, couple examples of uh, influences, artists who influenced our work and fed us some ideas and notions of how to approach uh, this idea of illness or the less mobile body or the chronically ill body through art and through performance. Um, Rebecca Horn. Uh, yeah, um, we'd long been interested in Rebecca Horn's uh, early performance work uh, that she kind of called under the subtitle Body Extensions. And it wasn't until really researching that work that I learned that these works came about um, when she was hospitalized for tuberculosis and could no longer, um, for a period of time, could not do the, the kind of more in, uh, material intensive sculpture practice that she had then. So she started making these uh, smaller, more portable um, props in order to, to use as body extensions, like the, the works are called. And, um, you know, obviously I felt a huge affinity there and um, always kind of loved and questioned the mythos because uh, she claims to, to have made many of these uh, props in, in her sick bed. And, you know, I, as someone who makes a lot of props and who, who is very messy making those props, I always wondered how it was feasible that she would be making them through in bed. Um, but, you know, I, I, I love the idea, no, nevertheless. Another important reference point for us is uh, Bob Flanagan and uh, is basically approach this idea of illness in a different way. Uh, Bob Flanagan is a performance, was rather a performance artist uh, who, who died from uh, cystic fibrosis in his mid 40s, uh, which is at least a, in the mid 90s was a very long yeah, he, he lived, lifespan. Usually, well, at the time, people with cystic fibrosis would die. Very young. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Bob Flanagan, because, you know, having this illness, you're constantly in, in pain. And the uh, Bob Flanagan was interested in combating or, uh, oh, yeah. Distracting? Distracting pain, I guess, or combating pain with pain. So a lot of his performance involved uh, BDSM. And he worked in collaboration with his partner. Uh, whom? Sherry Rose. Sherry Rose, thank you. I, I couldn't find her name. Sherry Rose. And um, it, doing those public performances of BDSM. And for uh, Bob Flanagan, basically, you know, pain would basically distract him. It would, it would enjoy this new pain because it would just kind of like take him away from the everyday pain. Well, which, it, it was a chosen pain. Yeah, it's a chosen pain. So, so it, it's some sort of control. And the next sketch is inspired from this uh, story and it's titled Julie. It was the third sketch in the order. Which was well, uh, performed by... Uh, I need to tell you again. Julie's pain is not gone, but objects have become extensions of her body and these things help her live with the pain.
She adds material and volume to her own body, diluting the pain by extending her body in space. So uh, the last subject matter and the one subject matter that perhaps like englobes everything, all the 10 sketches together is this idea of affect as choreography. I will like through the different dimensions of the work, this idea of affect or the effective or uh, affection or attachment or relationships is what uh, binds the subjects that matter to, together, the different subjects matter we broach, but also uh, is kind of like a, a catalysis for the performers to do their movement. Uh, the, uh, also a catalysis for the decisions that are taken on stage, uh, usually by the performers, like, as a live setting, like, you know, directly on, like, in, on screen or, you know, in, the, in its first form, and we'll talk about this in a bit, as a per, uh, live performance piece. And this is a Winnie O uh, performing uh, duplication. B basically, this work, uh, this, or, or, sorry, this sketch, and this is the last sketch from the, the video that's in the exhibition we're going to be showing you, um, is about how basically it's kind of like a, a bit of a how to or how the old piece is written in terms of choreography. A lot of it is asking of the performers to react to objects directly. And we don't usually, especially in this piece, we weren't directing them necessarily to specific objects or to specific movements, but we were kind of like crafting the directions in a way that they had a lot of freedom. So every time they would kind of like, let's say, perform it for the camera, like you know, let's say we do three takes for one sketch, every time it would be a new performance. So this is it. Mirroring is how we understand. Understanding is how we gain empathy. So, uh, do you want to go or should I finish this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, maybe I'll interject. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the effect is something that is found in, you know, the shapes, the weight of the objects and directs the performers, like, you know, because of their qualities. And this is a really good example because th this kind of wreath of rubber things is uh, was something that was really attractive to a lot of them because it, it, for one, it's really heavy. Yeah, and for two, it really has like this, be because the pieces are all kind of interlaced together, it really has a lot of in inherent movement to it. Yep. It bounces a lot. It's, it's kind of formless, yeah. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier in the talk that we really think about these different material properties of the objects because we, you know, we, we think about the performers handling them and wanting to make things that have texture, that has movement, that has a, a kind of reaction to being deployed are, are all uh, I don't know, I guess important qualities that we think of when making props that are really going to take up a lot of space. So uh, like I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, is it the sun or the asphalt? Oh, I see it's bright black started as a live performance piece. It was designed as like a sort of 
cabaret for basically the bar <laughs> at Art Toronto in the 2016, the fall 2016, and it was commissioned by Drake Hotel. Um, and it was a bit, it was pretty much shaped the same way where you had this 10 sketches, but except there was no background music. And uh, like you can see here, uh, the performers were having a headset and a microphone, the headset for uh, the directions and a background music for them to pace themselves on and the microphone to amplify the lines that they had to repeat, basically the voiceover that you hear in the video that they basically had to do live. And we had set up the, the cabaret as a, you know, a sort of like kind of a garden of objects for them to choose from. And the idea basically was for them to really kind of go with what they found attractive, what they found pleasurable or interesting or potentially pleasurable to play with from this kind of the like gamut of objects that was on the wall. And at the same time, you know, it served that bar decoration. But anyways, it, it felt it felt like we really had to kind of go further with it and turn it into a film, which we did. Yeah, I mean, there was something really interesting about presenting a work like this at an art fair where we're doing something just so weird and non-commercial and in the middle of a space that is also a space for people to hang out. But at the same time, um, it, it also felt like we could take the ideas and, and go a lot further with it than just doing a one-off performance in a very awkward space. And, oh yeah, that's a short clip, but we'll pass that. Um, and uh, a couple notes about the installation that is at Cambridge Galleries is uh, on top of the video and the performance props, which are exhibited in a room adjacent to the video, we have uh, two what we call table sculptures, basically some uh, sculptural items that we uh, made to kind of bridge the gap between the video and the performance props. Because yes, we want the performance props to be there to be uh, evocative of what uh, the performers had to handle and like what provoked their choices, you know, as performers when they interpreted the, the sketches, but also, you know, like kind of a, a sort of, we wanted a sort of remand, reminder of their presence in the sculpture room, sort of the visitors to kind of like make that bridge between uh, the, the prop the the video visuals and the experience the idea of experience and the, the presence of the body so uh yeah so basically those are kind of like poems sculptural poems that we wrote to ourselves in a way and uh and yeah and that, that pretty much that's a little close up from one of the sculpture tables and that pretty much rounds it out for uh or deep dive into is it the sun or the asphalt all I see is bright black? And... Yeah, um, I guess I just wanted to mention one thing. We had we noted the, the interpreters who were performing the work. And I just wanted to mention that our voiceover artists oh, yes. um, were- uh, Alexis Oero. Yeah, I, okay, sorry. I'm saying it. We're uh, two uh, colleagues of ours, yeah. um, Alexis O'Hara, who is a Montreal-based multidisciplinary artist, and Tanya Evanson, who is a Montreal-based multidisciplinary artist, poet, dancer. And um, we're, you know, sometimes it's not always obvious to think about the performers that you don't see on the screen. So I just wanted to, to shout out their names real quick before we go to discussion. Well, thank you. I guess I'll stop share. Here we go. It's so weird doing this on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit of a weird experience for sure. Uh, thank you both so much. That was such a great uh, deep dive into the exhibition and your artistic practice. Um, so we are going to start the question and answer session now uh, just to remind everyone that if you want to ask uh, Chloe and Yannick a question, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please feel free to write any questions you have in there. I'll get the, uh, the question uh, 
section started. Um, so with my previous conversations with the both of you, uh, I learned that experimentation is, is extremely important um, to your practice. And it, it kind of starts right up um, at the very beginning in your studio work, and it leads all the way into the installation of the work. Um, and since I believe you said this is the only the second time um, that is at the sun or the asphalt, all I see is bright black that has been installed in a gallery. Um, it could you could almost argue that it's a site specific installation for Queen Square Gallery. Um, now I know you're you're typically very hands on in the install process, kind of figuring out things where they go. Um, that wasn't really possible in the pandemic situation. So, and I know you spent uh, several months in your studio, kind of placing things, trying to imagine what it would look like in a space that you actually haven't stepped foot in. So, how how was that experience for you? Oh my god! <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it was it was interesting. It was. Uh, it, yeah, we, we moved in a year ago in this studio, a year and a half ago in this new studio, and we're like, I, I was really, oh, thank God we have oven foot ceilings, <laughs> because, uh, you know, we kind of tried to replicate the conditions, the 13 foot ceilings at Cambridge Galleries, and so, uh, so that was really practical, but no, it was, it was, it was interesting, at the same time, it was, uh, you know, uh, it, it was interesting, revisiting the work and handling it again and you know I, I think to kind of make decisions in advance and try to be also lenient in the ways the objects were going to be handled in the gallery and understanding of you know like the the you know there's so much you can say okay this needs to be placed like this and this way so you know and we tend to be we tend to be really open in the way and really kind of lean in the way we work with performers, but with gallery installation, we tend to be more strict, but you know, that now it's like, we, we can't be there. So yeah, it, how can we I mean, that? it's strange because we're really intuitive with how we deploy our objects. And this was actually by choice because earlier in our practice, when we were doing instances that were mostly made of screen printed paper, um they would kind of be like planned down to the square inch and we started to like feel the limitations of that and it was also kind of not really us um it was it was like taking a practice that it in a way in ways was very intuitive very improvisational and then trying to fit it in different spaces uh and and we kind of had to like make ourselves unlearn that and then now that we're working where it's really just like we show up with the crates of stuff and we kind of put them, you know, where as we see fit and sometimes things don't all get put up and sometimes things are going to get made real last minute to, to add into the mix. Um, I don't know, I guess we, we, we just kind of realize like how much our own practice is kind of guided on like how does this feel here and how does how does the texture of this butt up against the texture of that so a lot of the kind of ideas we were thinking about with working with um, performers handling the work were the same kind of ideas we had with deploying it in space but we hadn't necessarily thought about that um in, in as like a direct line and then when we're testing it out to, to, to create instructions so that other people can hang out. It was like, kind of like, oh, they're, they're you know, as, as intuitive as this is, there's a real like logical consistency. Yeah, we're fans of scenography too and kind of revisiting the installation and kind of creating an expanded version of it for Cambridge was a, was a real treat, that, that's for sure. Um, and uh, also like, it gave us a chance to uh, visit some sculptural ideas we had when the work was created in 2016, 2017, that the space that it got first exhibited in didn't really allow, it didn't really have the space for that. I mean, uh, the gallery now is perhaps like three times the amount of square footage in the first one where it was exhibited. So we really kind of gave the chance 
uh, ourselves a chance to go nuts with those ideas and really kind of push the envelope a bit. So that was great. Yeah, it was great. I mean, your document that you sent over was uh, obviously extremely helpful to all yeah. of us who were installing. It was great. Um, oh, I just have a question that has popped in here. Let me see. Um, that says, can you discuss your development from 2D to 3D art? So I, I, I'm believing that's kind of stemming from uh, Chloe when you mentioned the screen printed uh, installations uh, that both of you have worked on previously, as especially as Seri Pop. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess to bring it back even more, like when we were doing screen printed installations that grew out of doing screen printed posters, um, primarily event posters, like we had a really long time as musicians in avant-garde music and um, as we, we, we started making posters for our bands, for our colleagues and stuff like that. So um, we, we, uh, we spent nine years where we made about 500 different screen printed posters. And I guess the, the, the most like direct thing was, was because we were making these 2D objects that would then get pasted up in the streets and on the urban furniture. Um, so we'll take that shape. Yeah, especially in Montreal, um, you know, in the early aughts, the, the kind of gentrification boom that we're having now still hadn't fully happened. So we still had a lot of construction sites, a lot of boarded up buildings, uh, and a lot of just a lot of real estate for for street postering and it was really from seeing the posters in the street and how they would react on different um structures but also as the like thick skin of posters would start to like become unglued through weathering that we kind of started thinking about um installation potential and sculptural potential of these things and performance too and further further down the line as well like seeing the kind of thing evolving in a long stretch of time yeah and <clears throat> and seeing that the 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 material itself kind of have this lifespan where mm -hmm. it would change um i mean it's it's strange almost strange now because we there's very little that we do that is really strictly 2d even our photographic work are like meant to be these drapey flowy things with little things propping them up and and around and um i i, I feel like like even though there's such a through line from like making these posters and then seeing them kind of collapsing on themselves or see them like inhabit different structures that it almost feels like they were done by different people. <laughs> oh, that's, and that it's, it's curious because that question actually set me up for my next question. So uh, thank you audience member, um, because I was thinking about it um, and I've read previous interviews where like you just mentioned, uh, Chloe, that you guys kind of started out printing these posters for your band AIDS Wolf and that's kind of how your visual arts practice kind of developed and grew. Um, so I was curious if your experience as musicians when you're performing all around, um, if that kind of helps to influence your visual arts practice nowadays too with the performance and just the different elements. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well for one like we I mean, it's super interesting because like when we were doing the poster thing and then the band thing, like side by side, we never want to merge the two together. You know, it's like one I was, mean, they were completing each other. Having the poster for the band or having the like album artwork for the band was as, as much as they could intermix. Yeah. Right, right. We, right. We were against having the two things meet on stage. And, and there was a lot of um, <clears throat> strong suggestion and even pressure that we would create these decorated stage spaces, which to us seemed just super corny at the mm -hmm. time. So, so it took us a while to kind of like get reinvested first in performance and second into kind of sound work and our visual arts work. Mm -hmm. Because of that, because we were like, uh, we felt it was well corny, but also kind of like we were- It felt so too obvious yeah, maybe, I don't too know. Obvious, but we I felt mean, not ready. You know, we, right? you know, we dropped out of art school. So in a way we're kind of these like reactionary jerks 
where we're just like we can't do what anybody thinks we should do yeah we're gonna do the opposite thing <laughs> but uh, in 2015 uh in our insulate no in our performance uh, titled five tabloid bounces back which got presented at darling foundry and then at our gallery in vancouver uh we invited our bandmate alex moskis who was in aids wolf with us uh to write the score and it was the first time we actually like commissioned someone to write music and from that uh we started collaborating with other people but then we started writing our own music for our own pieces and now we're like you know now we've done an opera and we're doing a musical right now right. So, okay. yeah so maybe i mean I guess there is this like inherent respect towards other performers because we have had a long time performing, but I think like even more than that, it's like from com coming from DIY music and bands where we wrote collaboratively, we when we work with different types of performers, like sometimes dancers, sometimes opera singers, sometimes we bring in choreographers to collaborate with. I feel like our time in bands really set us up where we can bring in people who we think are interesting, who we want to collaborate with and give them the rough framework of what we want to do and then sit back and like, you know, they do their part and we do our part. And like, we hope that intentions are going to meet up but we we really you know we're not trained as as choreographers in any stretch of the imagination and we're definitely not trained as composers our, our musical background is really through diy and and like punk rock and then avant rock and noise um but like this notion where like the different people create their parts and it comes together as a whole I think like is is really like a guiding principle so like we're e even when we're authoring the works and we have an idea of what we want we're really bringing people on because we know that they're they have something interesting to bring and that we're, we're not going to really be there to micromanage or control them too much so you know like when you're in a band and you're bandmate comes up with a part that you wouldn't have necessarily come up with you just go with it right and right. it ends up being more interesting in the end because you have more ideas being um blended together or at least you hope it ends up being more interesting in the end so i think it's like really in that kind of uh i don't know like non-hierarchical approach um, right. that we we really internalize from being in bands more than anything uh i mean We've, we've been really loath to perform in our work, though now with the pandemic, that's that's kind of uh, fallen out the window. We're making work, we're performing ourselves because, you know, we can't really be around people. Okay, great. <laughs> we had a new experience for sure. <laughs> but it, it, it really feels like we're having to build from the ground up, like we've been taking classes with choreographers and with mimes and different you know tr trying to like because you know we're working with these amazing dancers and opera singers and then we don't want to like have our janky selves being like Ooh, me. like <laughs> just really awkward and and you know not good like you know we're we're still pretty out of the practice of performing on a stage considering we I disbanded our band in 2012 so that's quite some quite some time ago at this yeah. point well, that's oh that's so fascinating thank you guys so much um we are at 8 11 here so we've gone a little bit over um i'll just give everyone uh if they have any more questions um a chance to write them in there um but while i do that i just really want to thank uh yannick and chloe for you know coming in virtually tonight to, to share your wisdom and uh, your art practice. It's been a, a real treat getting to know you guys these past couple of months and, and working with you, but uh, it's been really wonderful. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's been so great. Oh, it's and, our pleasure. Yeah, any yeah. last comments, uh, anything you want people to, when we are fortunate enough to reopen the buildings again, is there anything you would like people to kind of come away with when they visit the exhibition like any any hopes <laughs> I, I don't know oh 
I hope it's going to reopen again. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely hoping to. Oh, another. Oh, we have a, a couple people saying thank you so much. Really fascinating work. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. Um, it's yeah. it, your work is is truly unique and it's very thought provoking, um, but it's also vis very visually. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it draws you in. It's it's visually intoxicating. Um, I might say like it's just yeah. It, it's <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, let me just see here. Yep. So I guess we'll we'll call that for the evening. Again, thank you guys so much for for joining us tonight and talking and preparing that presentation. It was truly wonderful. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the continued support of the City of Cambridge, the Ontario Arts Council, and of course the Canada Council for the Arts. I would also like to thank my colleagues who are working behind the scenes tonight. Um, uh, ex sorry, exhibition coordinator Matthew Teagle and outreach and events liaison Veronica Rilson. I'd also like to thank the rest of the gallery team, director curator Mon Marcy Bronson, uh, sorry, community special engagement specialist Gabrielle Claremont, and education coordinator Robert Thody. But most importantly, I want to thank the audience. Um, obviously, without your uh, participation tonight, we wouldn't really have much of a, an event. So thank you, audience. Uh, we look forward to uh, being able to invite you back into the gallery space uh, once it is safe to do so, so you can experience the exhibition. Is it the sun or the asphalt? All I see is bright black. In the meantime, you can go to our website. We do have um, a couple things uh, that will uh, you can access virtually that will support the exhibition. We have a reading list that was created by one of our librarians at Idea Exchange, Megan Casey. And so there's a whole bunch of resources that she's pulled from the Idea Exchange collection that you can borrow, um, books, CDs, even movies that complement different themes that uh, she found were relevant for you. Uh, we also have an upcoming free virtual workshop with art therapist Jasmine Tufford Singh, uh, where participants will get to explore um, the idea of the mask and what this mask means to us in the current pandemic. Um, and kind of you can either create a 2D or 3D version of the mask using materials around your home. Um, so that's it for me. Um, Chloe and Yannick, I'll let you say your goodbyes if you like. And thank you guys so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, we're always pleased to go deeper into some work, uh, even when it's a little uh, stiff because it's online. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because you don't have the audience reaction, really, that uh, you, you're used that's to. The cat over there. So. Well, that's true. He's just yawning, though. <laughs> He's like, you guys are so boring. <laughs> uh, that's what cats you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. And a good night, everybody. Um, stay safe, stay well, and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye.